Interrupting your currently scheduled programming will be a video response to Deckrash regarding his response to Sister Sunshine's video, The Job Argument Fails. All citations of scripture will be coming from the New Jewish Publication Society translation found in the Jewish Study Bible. All citations will be provided in the description box. I feel that an apologetic gloss is being applied to the text to make it appear to be less subversive than it actually is. Let's begin. Job was a man who was righteous and upstanding before the Lord. Most likely he taught his children to be righteous and upstanding before the Lord. And if God chose that they would be take, to be taken out the picture, then it is not a stretch of the imagination to say that these children most likely did go to heaven. And they're at a they were in a place now that is far better than this world. The problem with this is that the author of Job explicitly denies the possibility of life after death. So when Yahweh allows Job's children to die, they are gone forever. And Job has no consolation. And I'm going to provide some passages from Job which illustrate this quite clearly. I'm going to read the entirety of chapter 7 first. This is Job speaking. Truly man has a term of service on earth. His days are like those of a hireling, like a slave who longs for evening shadows, like a hireling who waits for his wage. So have I been allotted months of futility. Nights of misery have been apportioned to me. When I lie down, I think, when shall I rise? Night drags on, and I am sated with tossings till morning twilight. My flesh is covered with maggots and clods of earth. My skin is broken and festering. My days fly faster than a weaver's shuttle, and come to their end without hope. Consider that my life is but wind. I shall never see happiness again. The eye that gazes on me will not see me. Your eye will seek me, but I shall be gone. As a cloud fades away, so whoever goes down to Sheol does not come up. He returns no more to his home. His place does not know him. On my part, I will not speak with restraint. I will give voice to the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I the sea or the dragon that you have set a watch over me? When I think, my bed will comfort me, my couch will share my sorrow. You frighten me with dreams and terrify me with visions, till I prefer strangulation, death to my wasted frame. I am sick of it. I shall not live forever. Let me be, for my days are breath. What is man that you make much of him, that you fix your attention upon him? You inspect him every morning, examine him every minute. Will you not look away from me for a while? Let me be till I swallow my spittle. If I have sinned, what have I done to you, watcher of men? Why make of me your target and a burden to myself? Why do you not pardon my transgression and forgive my iniquity? For soon I shall lie down in the dust. When you seek me, I shall be gone. I'm also going to read the last verse of chapter 13 and the first 12 verses of chapter 14. This is again Job speaking. Man wastes away like a rotten thing, like a garment eaten by moths. Man born of woman is short-lived and sated with trouble. He blossoms like a flower and withers. He vanishes like a shadow and does not endure. Do you fix your gaze on such a one? Will you go to law with me? Who can produce a clean thing out of an unclean one? No one! His days are determined. You know the number of his months. You have set him limits that he cannot pass. Turn away from him that he may be at ease until, like a hireling, he finishes out his day. There is hope for a tree. If it is cut down, it will renew itself. Its shoots will not cease. 
If its roots are old in the earth, and its stump dies in the ground, at the scent of water it will bud and produce branches like a sapling. But mortals languish and die. Man expires. Where is he? The waters of the sea fail, and the river dries up and is parched. So man lies down, never to rise. He will awake only when the heavens are no more. Only then be aroused from his sleep. I'm also going to read verses 12 through 15 of chapter 34. This is Elihu speaking in reply to Job. For God surely does not act wickedly. Shaddai does not pervert justice. Who placed the earth in his charge? Who ordered the entire world? If he but intends it, he can call back his spirit and breath. All flesh would at once expire. All mankind return to dust. The words translated as spirit and breath in verse 14 are ruach and neshama. This is important because this passage in Job reaffirms the model provided to us in Genesis. For example, this is from Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth. He blew into his nostrils the breath, neshama, of life, and man became a living being. So, at this point, we have a concept of mankind being an entirely material, corporeal being animated by the breath, the neshama, of God. And this is also reaffirmed in Genesis 3.19. By the sweat of your brow shall you get bread to eat, until you return to the ground. For from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So, when, when man dies, the animating breath, the neshama, returns to God. So, for Job... There is no consolation for his lost children. They aren't going to heaven. There is no such a concept. They're gone. Also, another thing that people don't... Re the people who would say something like what Sister Sunshine said, don't realize that the misfortune that befell Job was courtesy not of God, but ultimately really of Satan. God allowed the devil to do this to him. He allowed people to come and murder his children. He allowed people to come and take his and take everything that he owned. Another thing. Job's family was a blessing unto him. Yes, that's true. He said he was a man blessed of God. God allowed that blessing. We, we covered that already. And he, he, and he also allowed that blessing among others, the blessing of his children among other things to be taken away. But the question is, are we to look at God as the one to blame? Those who killed Job's family, those who went in and killed Job's children, they were people. They did it of their own free will. But Job does blame God. He does not blame Satan. He does not blame other human beings. He blames God. For example, I'm going to read verses 1 through 7 verse 15 and verses 18 through 21 of chapter 10. I am disgusted with life. I will give rein to my complaint. Speak in the bitterness of my soul. I say to God, do not condemn me. Let me know what you charge me with. Does it benefit you to defraud, to despise the toil of your hands while smiling on the counsel of the wicked? Do you have the eyes of flesh? Is your vision that of mere men? Are your days the days of a mortal? Are your years the years of a man? That you seek my iniquity and search out my sin? You know that I am not guilty, and that there is none to deliver from your hand. Should I be guilty, the worse for me. And even when innocent, I cannot lift my head. So sated am I with shame, and drenched is my misery. Why did you let me come out of the womb, 
Better had I expired before any eye saw me. Had I been as though I never was, had I been carried from the womb to the grave. My days are few, so desist. Leave me alone. Let me be diverted a while, before I depart, never to return, for the land of deepest gloom, a land whose light is darkness, all gloom and disarray, whose light is like darkness. Also going to read verses 16 through 23 of chapter 30. So now my life runs out. Days of misery have taken hold of me. By night my bones feel gnawed, my sinews never rest. With great effort I change clothing, the neck of my tunic fits my waist. He regarded me as clay, I had become like dust and ashes. I cry out to you, but you do not answer me. I wait, but you do not consider me. You have become cruel to me, with your powerful hand you harass me. You lift me up and mount me on the wind. You make my courage melt. I know you will bring me to death, the house assigned for all the living. Also verses 35 through 37 of chapter 31. Oh, that I had someone to give me a hearing. Oh, that Shaddai would reply to my writ, or my accuser draw up a true bill. I would carry it on my shoulder, tie it around me for a wreath. I would give him an account of my steps, offer it as to a commander. So, Job blames God directly for his calamity because he knows that he is innocent and unlike what his friends have said, he has done nothing to deserve it. And how does God reply to Job's friends at the end of the book? Uh, verse 7 of chapter 42. After Yahweh had spoken these words to Job, Yahweh said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am incensed at you and your two friends, for you have not spoken the truth about me, as did my servant Job. Additionally, verse 11, All his brothers and sisters and all his former friends came to him and had a meal with him in his house. They consoled and comforted him for all the misfortune that Yahweh had brought upon him. Not Satan, not the people involved. Yahweh directly is held responsible. Another point here. <clears throat> I want to say that th those who still wish to accuse God after all this, to those who wish, still wish to accuse God, to point the finger at him after all this, I say to them, can you compare yourself to God? You need to look at what God's conversation with Job was. He asked him, were you there at the beginning? Were you there when I cre laid the foundations of the earth? You know, he tells him, like, can you do this? Can you do that? You know, are you me? Of course not. Job knew that what that that in the end of the day though Job wanted an answer as to why God never gave him an answer always is it's completely as to why but he helped him to understand that under you know it's to to trust in him and understand him and say look I'm much bigger than you I'm I'm smarter than you I'm wiser than you you need to trust me and in the end Job's trust in the Lord worked to his benefit the devil struck him with sicknesses and boils but never, ever did Job curse God. He was upset, he was anguished, he was in pain and grieving. But he, and he didn't know what was going on, but he never, ever lost his trust in God. And despite the loss of his children and his family and all that he owned in the end, though Job did not know what was going on, and even God himself came down from heaven at least helped Job to realize that why is not, why in this case is not important, just Know that I'm God. In the end, because of Job's trust, God blessed him with twice what he had. Does Yahweh really ask Job to trust him? After reading chapters 38 through 41, which constitute Yahweh's reply to Job, and I would recommend anybody read that if they haven't, those specific words aren't used. In fact, uh, it seems to consist of a series of hypothetical questions which assert Yahweh's power. You know, for example, where were you 
when I laid the Earth's foundation? You know, and other questions like, you know, can you do this? Where were you when I did this? Do you know this? You know, knowing that Job is going to have to answer in the negative. You get the impression that Yahweh is saying, once you know these things, and once you can do these things, then maybe we can talk. But until then, keep yourself quiet. And what's Job's response to this tirade? Does Job say that he's going to have faith in God? I'm going to read Job's response from chapter 42. And the Jewish Study Bible mentions that the first half of verse 3 and verse 4 may have been words of Yahweh which have gotten jumbled into there. So I'm going to leave them out. It, it reads more smoothly. Job said this in reply to Yahweh. I know that you can do everything, that nothing you propose is impossible for you. Indeed, I spoke without understanding of things beyond me, things which I did not know. I had heard you with my ears, but now I see you with my eyes. Therefore, I recant and relent, being but dust and ashes. So it seems like what Job's doing here is capitulating and dropping his suit against God, recognizing that being a near mortal, it's pointless. And given the way that Job's concession comes across, how does Yahweh's blessing him uh, with material wealth and additional children come across in the latter part of the chapter? It, it comes across a, as a bit of concession on Yahweh's part also. You know, he, he comes across to me as basically thinking something like, well, you know, Job, Job's fallen into line now, and yeah, I, I might have done some things which, which were kind of screwed up. So, you know, here, here's a bone thrown to you, Job. That's the way that comes across to me. Certainly not Job tr never losing his faith or trust in God. And while he doesn't curse God per se, he certainly does indict God for all of the misfortune which happened to him. And in Yahweh's response to Job's friends, Job's accusation seems to be vindicated. So this really doesn't come across to me you know, as a tidy little story of someone's unrelenting faith in God despite all kinds of adversity. No, it's really not saying that at all. It, it's painting the, the picture of a God who, because he's God, simply cannot be held responsible for any misfortunes which happen to us. You know, we, we can try to blame him, yes. But to do so is really pointless, because what can we do about it?